The following is a conversation with my friend Alan Arslanagic, the founder and CEO of Visium, Switzerland's hottest startup. Alan has been selected by Forbes as one of the most successful young entrepreneurs in Europe and he's also been a great inspiration to me personally. I've looked up to him ever since we met for the first time in Switzerland about two years ago. This is the first out of two podcast episodes. In this episode, we talk about happiness, self-improvement, and how entrepreneurs change the world. Visium is a cutting-edge AI startup helping corporations make use of their data. They hired some of the smartest AI and software engineers from ETH Zurich and EPFL in Switzerland, and they're actively hiring for technical and non-technical roles. Enjoy the conversation. By the way, sorry, it's going to be a bit of a weird remark, but I'm not sure if we just transitioned naturally into starting the podcast or we were to do an intro or how you introduce typically the podcast. So oh, I yeah, I'm going to do an intro. Um, okay. So people are watching now. Actually, I guess we are already in the show now. <laughs> sorry. I didn't no have problem. a formal start. No Welcome on the podcast. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Did you have some role model as you were growing up for, for you know, someone inspiring you? Yeah, definitely. It's... Uh, I think people laugh about this, but Elon Musk has been definitely their role model, and by far. Um, I wonder about others, if there were others, but I remember when I was six, I don't know, maybe I was 18, I don't, don't exactly remember when I read it. Uh, I read an article about him. My dad gave me a newspaper, and it's the first time I learned about Elon Musk, so about tw 10, 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it was such a game-changing moment for me because up until that moment I was set on entrepreneurship but I thought it more as a means to live life on, on my terms and make sure I can take the best care to my family right if there is any need mm -hmm. whatever and when I read this story I thought wow this is like the most insane guy that is tackling the bi biggest like the oil interest etc starting from nothing pretty much and being able to change like solving climate change everyone i mean yeah, it's pretty yeah. much big on everyone's agenda but who like he's been having such an insane leverage to to start something i mean it started obviously with car there's so many others but he, he br brought this momentum now on the legislation legislation would have never happened without tesla or the car makers are moving there so this kind of el electrification move which sort of gives hope that we maybe can overcome you know, yeah. before there was more of a kind of depressing view, okay, like it's a huge problem and there is nothing really happening, so are we going to solve it or not? And even now, it's still, we're still such a high risk that, you know, what yeah. we do, um, no matter what we do, is still going to bring terrible consequences to Yeah, to I mean, the, the big difference between him and like, you know, obviously there have been Steve Jobs and many other people who have done big impact and, you know, literally pushed us technology-wise forward by several years but Elon Musk is like a whole different level right yeah he just looked at certain things that huge companies and countries can't solve as one guy with you know a bunch of smart people around him and he was like I'm gonna solve this and he actually did it yeah I think that, that has never really been around at such a scale absolutely yeah I fully agree with you and I think very few people get it but as you say like for me is on a is playing on a completely different league than what you've seen in the past i mean steve job has definitely changed the world and there is many benefits to giving access to information uh, and this kind of you know enabling everyone to, to to what we can do today with the iphones and on and on the smartphones that followed and copied but there is not this very st strong focus on for good if you see what i mean yeah. or, or really solving the most important problems it indirectly helps with education, access to information, and progress, and all of that. But at the end, you know, Elon Musk says he has two questions when he starts a company, and one is, is it really important, and is it feasible from physics principles? I think it's incredibly inspiring. Absolutely. One thing that I also wanted to discuss with you, so last time when I visited you in, in Zurich, you told me one really eye-opening thing. So you kind of asked me, what is your big picture or big idea behind the system? And that moment, I didn't really have a good answer. I mean, you know, I have big dreams, obviously, on these things. But at that moment, I just never really thought much further than assist. I was just focused on, you know, making assist to survive. Um, and then you said, well, you explained to me now, OK, maybe I might be risk misquoting this because maybe I kind of mixed my own ideas into this. But there's like three stages of a really great entrepreneur. So the first stage is, you know, the first company that you 
like likely fail doesn't even matter too much. Uh, maybe multiple companies in the second stage is you know the first business that you build that really makes a lot of money that's very profitable, and in the third stage is something huge you know like Elon Musk style you know then you have a lot of money to put on the table everybody takes it seriously and you can do something huge whatever you want. Um, how, how do you see this process? Did I actually say that correctly or did I kind of forget and then change what anybody told me? It could have, uh, uh, probably you quoted it right, but I just don't remember <laughs> <laughs> having, uh, having uh, discussed about this with you, but my memory many times uh, betrays me, let's say, so could have uh, very well been that. But it's true, like at the end of the day, uh, it, it does make sense. And, um, and I'm, for me, I've always been very motivated to eventually reach this last stage and try to make something that has a massive impact in the world and and at that point it's not like m capital is really a means to uh, accelerate change and 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 change things and so um, so yeah do you think visium is a I, stage two or a stage three I, that's a good question i think we are now at a stage two and we might get at a stage three what if is your you, dream for a stage three? We need to crack the code in stage three of scalability, which currently we haven't cracked because we are obviously we, we're investing a lot, like really a lot in products and building scalable solutions. But we are not yet at a stage where one of our products has started the, the very scalable path. Yeah. So we are working to get on stage three for sure. But I wouldn't say we are we cracked it yet and we are there yet. Yeah, it's it's a bit linear. I mean, if you do like work or like kind of applied consulting in your case, that is a linear thing, can make yeah. a lot of money, obviously, yeah. but something that can really exponentially blow up is always hard to find. Um, so what is your big dream for, for your stage three, either for, with Visium or for you personally? It get, I mean, I'm very excited on the intersection between very cutting edge and massive positive impact on the world. And so I don't know, protein engineering, discovering, uh, gene therapies with AI on DNA data. All of these topics just sound super fascinating for me, as opposed to, I don't know, you can, there's massive companies being built in claims processing for insurance. And definitely you can build a massive company, but I would like something that's really purpose driven. Um, I would say we haven't found yet that for sure. We have some ideas here and there that we're considering. Um, and we'll need to, we'll need to see how, you know, how we get that started and, and scale it. Well, I'm really, I'm really looking forward to seeing where, where this journey is going to lead you. What about you? Have you and got to the answer to the question of what's your big, uh, big goal, big vision, big picture mm -hmm. for CISO? So I, I have actually. I started thinking about it more and more after, after that discussion. It's funny that you don't fully remember it, but maybe you said something similar and in my mind I just mixed up with my own ideas. Well, I don't know if a CISO, a CISO I mean, given that I'm not actively managing it anymore, it is kind of the stage one. Mm -hmm. for my co-founder Alexander that may actually end up scaling into stage two or three, but for me it is the stage one. The stage two is something that, you know, I'm currently looking for uh, to build. Uh, like just today I had a, ha had a call with, with a friend from MIT. We're looking into building something like on a quantitative crypto hedge fund or, or something in that direction. You know, something that can scale very quickly and hopefully also make a lot of money. Um, or maybe, you know, something else in the AI direction. I mean, this is like my background. But my really big dream for, for stage three, you know, assuming that stage two works, it makes a lot of money. Um, and then, you know, with stage three, I have enough money to get huge investors and do anything I want is really, I would like to do a quantum computing company. Um, I think at the moment, building a quantum computer is impossible slash insanely expensive. But I hope by the time, you know, I get to the stage three, the technology will already be far enough that I can really build a new Google of quantum computing. Mm -hmm. and I'll build, build a company, be it software or hardware, or maybe both that can perform calculations that can really revolutionize the world. Um, and I think quantum computing has probably the first big applications may not be in the field that I work in, which is like applications to AI and machine learning, but may happen in, in simula chemical simulations. Mm -hmm. That is, you know, I mean, um, all the molecules are driven or they, they follow the Schrodinger equation um, without going to, into too many technical details. But the degrees of freedom as you add more atoms to a molecule kind of blows up exponentially. Mm -hmm. So if you want to simulate like an actual drug that might, you know, cure a disease that is so complicated that you cannot really simulate it on a normal computer. So nowadays, uh, the way we develop medicine, 
it's still it's still very old school you know we have a bunch of smart people working for pharma companies with a lot of intuition they say hey let's try xyz and test it on stem cells and then you know they can maybe test that on a hundred maybe a thousand different products then you know they can move on to testing in mice and bigger and bigger animals and after many many years it may or may not reach the stage where an actual human can be can use it and I think this is really lame because you know if you can only test a hundred different types of drugs what are the chances that you're actually gonna get something that's really really good so in a quantum computer you could maybe test a billion different types of drugs or you can even run programs in some way in reverse you can give it a solution and find a the problem for it that is like the, the actual you know the, the solution is it yeah. cures a disease and the problem is like what is the what you know what is the molecules that you need to have and if you could run all these things in parallel simulate a billion different you know proteins or whatever and then get the one that really cures the disease then you could skip so many stages and get like the best best medicine in this world i think that's something that i really dream about um i think it's still you know moonshot project very far ahead but you know that may be you know the next big thing sounds great and i think all you need is just like a direction a compass a passion for this and eventually you will find a concrete opportunity along the way which you can maybe then scale into this as you say google of quantum computing it might be that you solve one specific problem there and you can build a massive business um and um, and it will see where it leads that would be really really incredible yeah um, there is a lot of uncertainty though as to when practical yeah. applications will come might be 10 years might be 40 no it, yeah it can i mean yeah i, I don't know my, my advisor said it's going to be what did he say again? Five years plus or minus never or something like that. I don't really know what he meant with that, but you know, the expected time when we will have first semi-useful applications like 10 years may be a bit early, but it may also never happen. Mm -hmm. um, same thing, you know, with nuclear fusion. I think quantum computing, nuclear fusion are the current, you know, moonshot projects that we have. That's really cool. AI used to be that, but AI is now already real. So it's not a moonshot anymore. It is like actually doing the huge impact. So I think these are the two technologies that might revolutionize a lot of different sectors in this world. Um, cool. How you personally manage to deal with all of the stress, how you stay productive, how you stay motivated, what are your secrets or like life hacks to, to doing all of this? Yeah, I've been practicing a lot. Um, yeah, stress, I think um, you just over time, you, you get better and better. So these moments like, okay, I have 40,000, I need to figure out where they come from in two weeks. The beginning it's very stressful and the problems get bigger and bigger and you always solve them so you sort of build a confidence in yourself that you can solve them uh, but still there is um, there is, there can be often stress so it's you need to set up the work in a way that like if you're on top of your things and everything is running smoothly it's great and and you need to try to see things ahead and not sure if i'm being a bit too abstract now but <laughs> speaking more concretely i i try to you know, focus on goal-oriented planning. So I have my yearly goals, which turn to, I don't know if I do quarterly, I think I just do monthly. So I have a monthly increment to get to my yearly goal and then I split it in bi-weekly increments plus more smaller stuff I might be working on uh, along the time. Like now, for example, I have a challenge, I wanna stop alcohol until the end of the year. And so these kind of things, and I have a coach I'm working with every two weeks, and so it's quite convenient to have these deadlines every two weeks and, and keep delivering on this more important work, which is not necessarily urgent and doesn't get done. And, and if you see that you have goals and you're on track to achieve them, it's really what can remove the stress. Because if you work in a task-oriented way, to-do list, to-do list, you never get them done. And so you yeah. always feel like, you're not doing things and so at the end if you see this progress happening and you have trust that you know the main things are going in the right direction it works out and then we have put I, i'm personally putting a lot of focus in talent acquisition at visium even if it's uh, not the department i'm i'm directly uh, managing but it's something i really have at heart because i think it's very important to to hire the best and uh, and that's what's gonna enable that people can handle difficult situation without them coming back up to you to solve yeah. problems and so and it's quite difficult right like if you like talents uh, there is good talents there is great talents there is oh, like near rock star potential yeah. there's rock stars and if you're a, and, and it's very difficult to you know uh, there's great companies that have uh, good talents but we try to you know 
get to something that can also enable a company to really scale. I think it's critical to to raise the bar very high for talent and identify uh, the rock stars. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's a good, good way of putting it. And uh, what else? I think working out in the morning helps me a lot. I get uh, winning, like starting the day winning. Like you, you, you go to the gym. I, I t personally like to, you know, I get to work f by eight and I already did an amazing workout and I get like the, the, the energy from it and I feel just amazing. And just starting like that, it brings me a lot of clarity. It helps a lot. Um, it's like you at attack the day. You don't just let it, you know, yeah. start you slowly. You just go for it directly, and yeah. then you, by eight, eight o'clock, you already know you've done something, and then you have the energy to really power through the whole day. Absolutely. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, if you if you are making progress on your goals, it just gives you such a feeling. Uh, uh, it it gives you a great feeling, and everything else is um, kind of gets done by itself somehow. Uh, responsibilizing people like there, there's been a big shift I, I was going towards the burnout the first quarter of this year because uh, I have very high quality expectations mm -hmm. which brought me to a situation where I like to get m responsibility on myself at Visium because I have I want it to be done perfect I want everything to be perfect and so many times instead of okay here's a project for you I just know, okay, like maybe this person would do it for me 90% well, and I want to do it 98% well. And, and, and this brought me to me having so many responsibilities, which we were getting at the breaking point. And we did a big shift towards end of March, which was life-saving because it was going totally crazy. Uh, and just, you know, structuring responsibilities, objectives, giving them to people and responsibilizing everything. And it was a big shift for me this year and it happened it, it needs to happen now we're 50 people in the business and it's the break it or make it point like it you know every company once you're 10 people 20 50 100 you need to completely change the way you operate and so now we sh we pass this uh, you know difficult moment and and i'm super happy i'm happy f like i'm so proud of the people i'm working with directly and how they are you know handling things it's it's an amazing feeling i really feel um, I have important responsibilities, but I'm able, like, it's, I feel it's quite simple, the, the things I have to do, and everyone else is managing their part so well that there is um, not many fires burning, let's say, at Visium that we need to tackle us as an executive team. Yeah. The people are doing already a great job. Because the moment you start a company, I always feel like it's, a, it's like a house that's on fire. Yeah, And absolutely. trying to distinguish them, but there's everyone else is pouring oil in the fire. Yeah. And then moving from that moment to the moment where, you know, it's, it's running, it's like a train that's running and just occasionally need to steer it a little bit. I think that's a very, very big transition. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel, you know, do you still manage to have like a personal life next to like so much work or do you feel like that's very difficult? I think I do. And every year I feel it's a bit easier. Uh, the first years I couldn't imagine taking more holidays than just during Christmas. And then it slowly got to, you know, I can take a week during uh, summer. And now I, I pretty much have the four weeks. I have a very, I feel I have a very balanced life. Uh, it might seem from outside that it's insane hours of work, but I think it's quite reasonable and it's never, it doesn't, it very hardly gets to, to kind of toxic level of just like working like crazy. Yeah. So I really like it. And whenever I work, I'm very happy to work. I, I tend to, I don't know if, like it's, it just, you know, I might work sometimes in the evening just because I'm I'm alone at home. My wife might not be there and I just really want to do something. So it's really like a, a pleasure. And um, so what was your question about the personal life? I, I think I do have a pretty good personal life. Um, I don't like to do many social things on the weekends or or or, you know, events. I tend to I, some. I'm somehow v wired to always want to do something productive, not mm -hmm. from the sense it has to be something related to Visium or work, but something that's gonna bring me value in the future. And so if you put me on a beach with friends, I'm, I'm not very comfortable. Like, <laughs> I, I like it. Feeling. Unless I'm with someone, for example, like you, where I really appreciate sharing ideas, we're thinking about the future and quantum computing and where it's going and interstellar travel, that I love. But it needs to be that type of social setting. If it's just, okay, we're relaxing on the beach, we're taking the sun, I get very bored. And so I need to, like, I don't know, start reading a book, listening to an audiobook, yeah. working out. All of these things is the stuff I love to do. And so on the weekends, I tend to 
to go for more of those type of activities. Does yeah, it's sense? sometimes hard to explain that to, to people. You know, even in the evening, if it's like 9 p.m. and then everybody thinks, okay, well, now it's time to relax. But I just feel like if the moment I start relaxing, like not doing anything productive, even, you know, I consider hanging out with friends who, you know, I find it's inspiring as productive time. But like if it's, I don't know, just watching a movie or something like that, I just start. Oh, I don't like movies. It's so long. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I just feel like I wasted two hours. I forget about yeah. it two hours later and I just don't like it. Sometimes I watch them, but I really like to be, you know, chill. And, um, and yeah, it's just like, I guess your brain wires around that. And I think this crazy obsession for self-development comes from, if you really have a big goal, like I want to be a successful entrepreneur, let's say I want to be the next Elon Musk. I mean, I don't like whatever, like a very successful yeah, entrepreneur, yeah. stage two entrepreneur, you understand the market is brutal. It's very difficult to succeed. Your only way is you need to be, you need to build an excellent character. And there is a great quote about Jim Rohn that says, why you want to earn your first million? It's not about the money, it's about the character you build and the person you become. And so I think with entrepreneurship, you quickly learn how important it is to keep improving yourself. And, and if you're not just into this constant every day, you're better than yesterday. There's no way you can succeed. Yeah. And so... Otherwise, someone else overtakes you, right? Yeah. And then <laughs> if you just get used and you get the positive feedback uh, kind of about seeing your progress, you just get very wired to, to like to want to do that and not waste time. That makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. You know, the video I released on Sunday, um, you probably haven't seen it, but one thing that I talk about is, is that it's actually that. I mean, I explain to people, you know, this is kind of my trick to what, what I believe is my key, like to to working towards success, but I don't made like a little dis uh, disclaimer, like this is not a video explaining you how to maximize your happiness in life. But then again, and I mean, people, I can really understand. Some people say that their life is as good as kind of the integral over their entire happiness, like integrated through the whole life. But I don't see it like that, you know, there's gotta be a goal, right? I love this topic and I would like to elaborate a bit my thoughts on this, even if it's uh, not, uh, this, I, I really think that self-development and progress in life is what eventually can lead you to happiness. And I see a lot of people, even colleagues in my company, which are giving too much focus to work, too much focus on studies. You need to see your life holistically. You have eight categories in your life. You have uh, emotional uh, fitness, which is more like meditation, these kind of things. You have phys physical and vitality. I mean, uh, don't like uh, this concept comes from Tony Robbins. He has this way of you know structuring your life. So if people want to check it out, you can find easily an article that speaks about this. Then you have finance, you have career, you have intimate relationship, all of these things, and you you can score yourself on where you are one to ten on these and see how is your wheel of life. And based on that, you can prioritize which areas you need to work on. And if you're wired for self development, someone who's very um, um, stranger to self-development or doesn't really thinks about either himself critically what he can improve etc will I think will suffer much more in life and will not be able to address some areas of life so it's just for example um, I don't know intimate relationship everyone is born shy more or less and you need to work your way to become a social person be comfortable to you know maximize like just try to figure out and not like a great life doesn't just happen. You need to build it and you need to be proactive about it. And you need to think in my life partner, what are the things that are important for me? What are the things that are, you know, and, and just very proactively build towards that. And if you don't work your life just on, like don't try to improve yourself just in one area, you can get to an insane level of fulfillment, happiness, joy, gratefulness. Also think about it, like learning self-development very quickly brings you to stoicism, which is leading you to, you know, minimize the moments you're sad for no reason, for things you cannot control. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, very quickly you can learn about the importance of being grateful. Very quickly you can learn. So if you're into this area, you, I feel it, it's very likely you get to a very happy life if you see what I mean. So it might contradict to what you were mentioning before. Mm -hmm. Success. So it depends how you define success because success, you know, it's not, you can uh, earn two million per year. For me, if you, the rest of your life is in crumbles and you're not going to see your daughter's uh, graduation or school uh, performance or sad, things yeah. like this, it's, it's not successful. So it's important to, to see how you define it. 
Do you think that Elon Musk is happy? That's a good point. I'm not sure. He's very happy in the sense that that's like such an extreme of like such an edge case. Um, but and that I ask myself many times if I would want to, you know, if I could, let's say, imagine I could replicate and live his life. It's it's difficult. It's a difficult task because you really. I feel like he sacrifices everything. To the, I think like the sacrifice he goes through to live the life he does. It's it's insane. There's so it's constant suffering almost. Yeah. Like working every waking hours, sleep sleeping badly, and you know not sleeping pretty much, and it's just like it's there's a lot of suffering, not having like really having minutes counted on when he sees his his, uh, his family is probably into lots of resentment from members of his family about it, which is people he probably loves the most but at the same time he just feels this calling I would say uh, if I had to guess what goes mm -hmm. through so it's a quite a miserable life and many people don't don't understand it and they think oh, oh I would like to be like Elon Musk but he said it in an interview like I'm not sure I would like to be like me there's you know so I if you could I, choose to well, if somebody would offer you somehow magically that you manage to build something as great as Elon Musk, but in exchange you have to basically give, lose everything else in some way, um, and you know, kind of be in this constant stage of suffering as, as in some way he is suffering under quotation marks, would you do it? I don't think I would. And I ask my que this question, like I, I think about this a lot, like, and you know you can i think you can build businesses that change the world without sacrificing everything in your life yeah and i'm trying to go about this more like healthy sustainable way of doing something and being very effective with the time etc for example jeff bezos or other entrepreneurs i don't think they i think they have a much more normal life from the perspective of you know jeff bezos talks about it always spends time in the morning with bringing his kids to school whatever you know Definitely they work a lot, but uh, and so I, I would probably go more into this direction unless the only reason to sacrifice everything and actually do it is if the comp like if you don't do it, then humanity will suffer greatly. Yeah. And so in the case of Tesla and the transition to of, of the industry or even SpaceX, you could say they are really important things to solve. And so and then the rest that he's doing, it's that I don't think it takes him so much more time to manage yeah. other businesses. I mean, there exists a point where if you have something that is that great for changing the entire world, essentially the purpose of that is greater than your own purpose. In that sense, I would say maybe at that point I would maybe, you know, give up everything fun in my life for yeah. that. But yeah, but again, it depends yeah. what you're saying. When you tell me sacrifice everything, I'm thinking sacrificing my family. It means like... Yeah. You know, like it, it's not sacrificing the fun. I don't care about the fun. For me, work is fun. If you're passionate, you yeah. love what you do. Obviously, that deal thing is what you're saying. Exactly. So it's really just about your family, your kids. If you say, okay, you're not going to see your kids anymore. You have to be the typical, you know, stereotypical silly old father that is totally not present. It's, it's, it's a tough ask um, to, to disappear, you know, and... Yeah. Um, I guess, um, yeah, for some people it's more important than for others. And if it's just to do something great that impacts the world, it needs to be something that has a massive positive purpose. Yeah. If it's just bec because how you um, put it at the beginning was just a very big company that has a big impact, right? But it's not, you know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. this claims processing thing, I would definitely yeah, not yeah. do it for that. I would not do it to build some company that does something in insurance. If you see what I mean. Yeah, it's not a it great purpose to, for that sacrifice. So it either has a massive positive impact, and I think that if I don't do it, no one else will, or there is no way I would sacrifice, like, you know, my family just to, you know, make a big business. No. It's interesting because I've actually met someone who has done exactly that. Um, so I've worked in, in Kenya in an orphanage. So the person who start started the orphanage, his name is Charles Mulley. If you're interested, I'm going to link his autobiography. Um, he was a very successful businessman. So he's, he grew up on the streets. He had absolutely nothing, no proper education, no family taking care of him, nothing, nothing, nothing. But he, he was 
incredibly hardworking. And he first started working on a farm, became farm supervisor, started driving taxes, started a taxi business, and eventually became one of the wealthiest people in Kenya. And you know, he, he really went all the way from the absolute zero that he could possibly be at to something crazy. And then at some point, you know, he, he said, okay, well, there's so many kids who are at that same zero level, but they never have the chance to go to school or anything. And then at some point, you know, he decided to sell all of that, all of his wealth, all of his, anything that he had. And, you know, he had a family, had kids at that time. He decided to also completely sacrifice the entire time that he spent with them to build an orphanage and for day and night just on that. Still obviously had, he would interact with his family, but it was like very, very limited. I just thought that was, that was really impressive. I don't, I don't know if I personally would have the strength to do that. Um, but yeah, in his case, you know, it is a really great goal. He, he yeah. changed the life of 10,000 children so far. Um, I think that is a huge thing, you know, if you have the chance to solve, I don't know, climate change or something like that, that is maybe a case where I would consider that. But for anything lesser than that, I completely agree with you. It's, it's, it's too, much, too much of a price and normally you don't have to choose between these things, luckily. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's I, a good I thing. don't think they're mutually <laughs> exclusive. So yeah, you can, even in this case of the orphanage, I don't know exactly what was the dynamic that he needed to be so disconnected from the family completely. But uh, it seems like you can still make the two coexist. And instead maybe of building 120 uh, orphan like schools, you can maybe do them 100. You know? Yeah. So Maybe I, I scare people a bit too much. <laughs> <laughs> the things that I said, it's <laughs> not that bad. If you're an entrepreneur, <laughs> Yeah, there's totally nothing fine. else in your life. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, mm. and the last question, this is actually a question I was asked last week in a podcast and it was kind of cut off guarded. Um, but I'm going to ask you anyways, would you say that you're happy right now? Yes, I'm incredibly happy. That's like, great. Every day I'm so grateful, you cannot imagine. I'm, I'm in a great position right now. Sometimes it's more difficult than other times, but now I'm just... At, at the most happy I've been and, and, and it's consistent over time. So Amazing. I recently got married and that also is part of my happiness. But uh, yes, it's just, uh, I'm just so happy. And it, and it comes back to, you know, working on my life and trying to be the best I can be for whether it's for my brothers and sisters, whether it's for my parents, whether it's for my grandparents, whether it's for my wife, whether it's for, you know, just trying to, I love to try to impact positively people around me, to try to influence them in whichever way positive it can be. That gives me a lot of happiness too. I love my business. I love the people I work with. It's, I'm just so grateful for everything in my life. It's a dream I wanted to have and, and, um, and I could have been happier. I Amazing. You're a real inspiration to <laughs> me and I'm sure you'll see in the comment section soon to all the people listening. Thank you so much for the discussion. This was really fascinating. A pleasure. And uh, one quick uh, remark on my side, I would really like to be as accessible as possible. If anyone would like advice, if anyone would like quick call, quick thought, anything, if I can help in any way, just reach out to me to LinkedIn uh, on a personal note. And uh, yeah, um, thanks for joining in. Thank you Phil, for being here. Thank you so much for listening. I really hope you enjoyed this podcast episode. Our conversation was supposed to last for only 45 minutes, but I got so immersed into this conversation that we ended up talking for one and a half hours. If you want to hear the first part of our conversation, make sure to check it out as soon as we release it. We will talk about Alan's many startup attempts before starting Visium, filled with many successes and failures along the way. Also, if you would like to reach out to Alan personally to get in touch with him, you should do it with Instagram and not with LinkedIn, as I said, because he's way more active there. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this. Take care and goodbye until next time.